very pleased to welcome Zara Mohammed today to our Zoom call, um, the newly elected Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. And Zara, your, uh, uh, the announcement of your appointment was made on Sunday. So three days later, we're very privileged that you said yes to our invitation. I know you've been inundated with media invitations to speak. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I wonder if you could start by telling us a little bit more about yourself. It's extraordinary, really, that you're 29, the first woman to get this job. Tell us your backstory. How was it that you came to be in this role at the age of 29? Well, I just want to say um, thank you so much for having me. It's good to see a couple, maybe one or two familiar faces. Great to see you, Julie. Um, and honestly, to be invited as well. I think um, my life has been significantly different since Sunday 2 p.m. And um, there's been a lot of interest beyond my imagination. I cannot access any of my social media platforms. I'm hardly responding to messages. And I think it's been overwhelming the amount of support, encouragement and positive messages I've received. And, and of course, I've been doing a marathon of media. So it's kind of nice to have a conversation with you all, although I appreciate you're going to have lots of um, questions for me too. Um, so I had a little bit of practice. So myself, obviously, I'm Scottish, if that's not coming through. Um, and for the past two and a half years, I've actually been part of the MCB leadership team as the Assistant Secretary General. So I didn't just come out of nowhere. And prior to that, you know, I was heading um, a, a national umbrella body for Muslim students. So, you know, I've, I've been involved in leadership roles before. And um, Haroon, the previous Secretary General, he's like, Zara, I think you should be part of MCB. It'd be really good. So I was as le elected as part of his team. And as always, the work never stopped, you know, and I was I was part of delivery and leading. And COVID, I think, you know, was a time when we, we weren't really sleeping. It was 24-7. There was so much to do. And our communities were always in need of whether it was reassurance or guidance. And the best thing that came out of that, I think, was partnership as well as opportunity and generosity. And I think that's been across the board with all communities coming together because we had to provide another level of frontline, you know, essential work that, you know, we needed. And I think faith communities, you know, we've, the resilience we've had has come through our, our faith and that kind of spirit of keeping hopeful. Um, and I've been part of many really lovely interfaith, um, you know, online Zoom meetings, and we did interfaith week online as well, and even Ramadan at home online. So there's been a lot. And I think, you know, Taking the step to run for Secretary General was definitely a big one, but I couldn't have done that with the, without the encouragement of everybody else and the, the faith and confidence that our affiliates put in me that actually they knew that I could do the job and had the qualification and at no point was really my gender or age um, a question. So for me, it's been a bonus that actually I've been able to be seen as a bit of a role model or history maker um, that wasn't really intended. But it's nice and I've had so many encouraging messages of people and saying, you know what, it's really good to see that representation and in some ways overcome um, maybe the stereotypes of what Muslim women or women leading, you know, um, surround. So I hope that answers it. It, it, it does. It does more, more, more than answer uh, that question. And just, just to take you back a little bit more, um, you were mentioning that you've worked for a, a charity before this role and you've had these voluntary roles with um, the Muslim Co Council of Britain. But take us back a bit more. You're a, a graduate in human rights law. Did you ever one stage think of becoming a lawyer? I mean, what happened to divert you? Well, much to my parents. <laughs> um, much to my parents' disappointment. Yeah, I think part of my passion and the reason that I did the degree in, in, in human rights law is actually that making a change in the world and seeing, you know, the capacity of using, you know, these universal principles to, to benefit everybody. And I think that was really something that, you know, really inspired me like, wow, you know, is there another way we don't need to get into, you know, um, peace building, community building, and, and actually it starts at a very local level, although we can talk about it in a very international, sophisticated way and bringing it to our communities. And I've always been really passionate about community work. So since the age of 16, I've always been inv involved in local community projects, charity projects, you know, when I became part a student, whatever society I could sign up to, slowly realizing that was a great way to maintain myself and my degree. Mm -hmm. So um, I've always been really passionate, I guess, in change making mm -hmm. and that's probably... And and the fact that you chose to kind of pursue this agenda through your 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 uh, root of religion through Islam, um, does that point to the um, what does that point to in terms of the centrality of faith in your life? 
Yeah, I think for me, faith has always been at the core of everything I do and this idea that we're here to serve the whole of humanity. Um, you know, and that actually, you know, where there is dark, add light, you know, and where there can be goodness, then you should, you know, should add it. And, and I think this, this idea that, you know, the smile is uplifting, you know, just that whole, as a character, can we be better? Can we strive to do more? And then from an external point of view, you know, getting busy with good deeds and actions. So for me, that's always been at the heart of everything that I've done. And I also find as a the calming nature of faith which is in the resolve and the determination and the courage. And um, even on every step of the way, I've had to be quite courageous, you know, and to say, well, why not? <laughs> you know, um, if I want to do good, why can't I do it in a bigger way? So, um, and then here we are. And you were also associated with the Muslim Council of Scotland and you were head of media and communications there. Um, can you tell us more about that work? Uh, what was your involvement there? What kind of relations did you have with the media in Scotland and Nicola Sturgeon and the government? Yeah, yeah. So that was actually, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I guess, winding down from that role now. So that was all in parallel to my work in the MCB. Um, I think, you know, you've got to start local in some ways, although Scotland is a lot more than local. So I was heavily involved with a meeting with cabinet ministers, met Nicola Sturgeon herself. And I challenged things, especially on post-Brexit, you know, what about young people, unemployment, ethnic minorities, social mobility, you know, some of the, the topics that don't really get covered and extensive media coverage and engagement, especially with New Zealand, that was a really long day of interviews. Um, and I think also helping to break the barriers down between the Muslim community and the media. And, um, you know, we had meetings um, on Isar where he has a cross party group on Islamophobia. So he organized some fantastic meetings with tabloids and, you know, print media and press media and different and even um, terminology. And that was fantastic sitting in the, in the mailing room of the Daily Record with all the top editors and, you know, actually listening and having a really positive conversation on how we can bridge the gap gap and make um, I guess both sides come together more and also inspiring young people to take a role in journalism from different ethnic minority communities and then of course you know we've had to challenge issues on Islamophobia institutional racism but I must say it's been really great and I've really enjoyed all of my time in the Muslim Council of Scotland. I have to ask you this you joined the Muslim Council of Britain which includes Scotland and Wales and yet there's a Muslim Council of Scotland and a Muslim Council of Wales um, does the Muslim Council of Britain not represent Scotland and Wales? Well as a Scot there's plenty to do <laughs> and uh, sometimes a centralised body cannot always understand the needs and the the kind of the, the context in which, um, you know, when you're closer to home. So it's not that they don't represent, um, because we are an affiliate, MCS is an affiliate of MCB, but it's, you need a team on the ground that is able to do the work, understand the context, made up of the context itself. So it's actually credit to MCB. And through COVID, we've all been working together. And we've seen the guidance, God, how many different versions do we get, you know? So we all adapt it to, you know, what's happening in Scotland, our colleagues in Wales will adapt it to Wales and we all have our different ways to communicate, you know, that to, so, you know, we, we have weekly faith leader meetings with the Scottish government and we're able to give that feedback that this is working, this isn't working, this is what you need to be concerned about. And um, so it's all joined up and it works. So does the Muslim Council of Britain have a kind of overview or a higher status than the other two? Does it represent um, all the different Muslim councils at international level, for example? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't call it like a, a hierarchy. I would say that it's it's a partnership, but definitely we are all affiliates to MCB because we feed into that strategy. So it's not like it's done in a silo. Um, and I think that's been a real strength um, of MCB as well as recently in the pandemic that, you know, we're also on a national COVID response group where we've got all the key stakeholders feeding in to, OK, how can we best tackle this? And what's the reality on the ground? You know, because sometimes we can be really far away from the decision. making. You know, the decision making is far away from those that impacts. And I think you need to keep those lines of communication really clear and open. So the, the Muslim Council of Britain, um, I, it, it says, I've written this down, uh, has 500 uh, affiliated organisations. So they include mosques, charities and schools. And I believe you won the vote by quite a big majority, 100 to 60, which was a, a big majority. But to the lay person and someone who's not uh, a Muslim, I have an impression that 
most of those organisations will be male-led. I don't know if I'm right there. And therefore, your appointment as the first female Secretary General seems stunning. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, uh, we, we had a different gender dynamic. The voter break makeup was obviously different genders. But yeah, I mean, what, I, I, again, I just I'm very humbled by that faith and trust and, you know, um, male or female. It's, again, uh, really inspiring for me that, you know, people have put their confidence in me. And, and I have said that as well in my interviews, you know, it's the moms and scholars that voted me in, uh, as well as the schools, the women's organisations and, and the broad network. So, yeah, it's a testament to them, really. But do, you, do you think, honestly, you will have a, a particular challenge about authority? Will uh, the male hierarchy listen to you? Well, they're listening. <laughs> they're listening now, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, as a Scot, it's very difficult for you uh, to not hear my <laughs> loud and deep voice, you know. I mean, uh, jokes aside, no, I think, you know, getting to this position wouldn't have been possible if if I was going to be facing a lot of that already. And um, there are always going to be challenges as a, a woman in leadership. And I think many women would agree that that there are always challenges and um, I don't expect, the role itself is a huge challenge. So I, I don't expect any of this to be easy, but then shouldn't we be a little bit courageous and uh, in the pursuit of making a difference? Um, we've got to try, right? We'll do our bit and do our best. Um, thank you. So just a reminder to everyone on the call, do put your questions in, in the, the chat box there. Um, I've got another short round of questions for you, Zara. Have you got some water there? It's on you to one guest. You've got to survive the whole hour. Um, <laughs> so um, th this is about your relationship. You were, you were talking earlier about when you were with the Muslim uh, Council of Scotland and your relationship with Nicola Sturgeon and your conversations with the government there. Um, but the Muslim Council of Britain doesn't have that relationship with the with the UK government. Um, I think relations ended in 11 years ago, 2009, after a uh, um, disagreement, let's put it that way. Um, I wonder whether you this is a wrong that you would like to see righted and what uh, um, proposals you have to address that. I mean, I think the Muslim Council of Britain is the largest Muslim umbrella, umbrella organization. And I think a really good example of our work has been in the COVID response, where at times we've actually been ahead of the government in providing guidance, health and safety, you know, really bringing together the uh, affiliates and network and our network base. I mean, one of the first webinars we did, we had over, I think, 1400 people attend. And that was because of people worried about burial and bereavement and crem cremation and what was going to happen. So I think we've really galvanized organized on community and bringing so many different um, cross sections together. And so I think really it's disappointing at best that the government hasn't been openly engaging. Um, ourselves, we are open to that conversation and we think actually our work on the ground speaks for itself. You know, so we, we are representing our affiliates, we're working with them and we're making a difference because of them. Um, and so really it's for the government who is making policies in the interest of us all to engage with those, you know, bodies that actually are working on the ground so I guess it's a bit of a no-brainer and and as I say look, I'm open to conversation so from my side there's there's no problem there. I'm wondering if you have a proposal to make an initiative yourself and um, on the basis of just that you're it now you're secretary general. I think the media is doing a really good job of uh, telling everybody I'm the Secretary General and <laughs> what my manifesto pledges are, my policies and every other detail of my life. So, I mean, look, it's a change of leadership um, and with all changes of leadership, there will be a change of approach. And for me, I, I value conversation and relationship building and partnership. And it's not just about Muslims, but beyond that. And that's why I think this conversation we're having, well, I didn't realise I was going to speak for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there'll be other people joining the conversation, I'm sure, on the call. So one last question for me, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Rosie Dawson. Um, you said that everyone else has been kind of outlining what they think your manifesto should be. What is your manifesto? Yeah, so I mean, we're always good to work in threes. So there's a lot on there, which I'm sure you can look at in your own time. But for me, I guess the three um, um, urgent priorities will be to continue our COVID-19 response. I think particularly what we're seeing is the surge in mental health issues, um, the economic impact, as well as obviously 
the, the misinformation around vaccination. So I think we we'll continue our work, but we're looking not just at COVID, but post recovery as well. And I think for a long time, we're going to continue doing this work as we all functioning in a different way. Second to that, I think um, diversity and inclusion is a really important one for me. And I think that, you know, being a woman and a young person, we should definitely be as representative in our organization and in the work that we do. And our communities are so diverse, so we should reflect that. And then I think third is, um, you know, tackling Islamophobia and its pervasiveness, its global consequences. You know, as a Muslim, a visibly Muslim woman, you know, this is a daily challenge that we face. And I'm not just talking about the overt stuff, the physical verbal, but the institutional nature of it and inability to attain a job because you were a headscarf or the difference in treatment and, and so on and so forth. And there's lots of evidence for this. And then the, the what we're seeing is the socioeconomic inequalities COVID has really highlighted that many of our communities are facing. And I think um, you know, as, as a council, we really need to have some good, I well, have some strategies, but with once I finally get time to get a team together, <laughs> and we can maybe implement some of these things. Um, but yeah, there, there is some, you know, we're in some of the most deprived communities. And I think that's a big piece of work, but just a couple of high level bullet points for you guys. Right, yes. <laughs> well, good luck with that then, uh, Zara. Um, I'm just going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Rosie Dawson. Thank you. Hi, hi, Zara. Um, I've got a couple of questions, some of which you've sort of um, alluded to already. But when you talk about building MCB to be truly inclusive and diverse, um, which groups um, are you particularly thinking um, about have, have been perhaps excluded um, or which pockets of the country do you feel have been underrepresented? And I mean, how um, how granular are you going to be in sort of targeting those groups and making sure that you get them on board? And, you know, great question. I mean, you know, the way I see it is um, a great place to start is first working with our affiliates. You know, I mean, I, I'm a Muslim woman and I think more women at the table is always a good thing. Um, and young people is another focus of mine because I have a, a lot of established networks and I think understanding the context and the issues that they're facing but what I would say is that you know at this point I don't want to be specific about who who I should include who I should exclude or who I'm going to focus on and um, I actually want to to work with um, our affiliates to understand what is happening on the ground I think you've got to do a bit of listening first um, and understanding before you assume you've got all the answers um, and we represent a broad range of society. I mean, one of one of the the, the new members of our national council that was elected um, is a is Anna Huna, which represents disabled Muslim community and access to mosque. I mean, that's a wonderful um, result of you know the conversations we've already been having. One of my colleagues, Sister Rashida Hassan, she's been doing the proudly Black and Muslim um, flagship project for two and a half years. You know, we've we've massively increased our engagement there. So there's a lot of good work. I hope to continue there's lots of new affiliates that I want to have conversations with but as I said it's open right now you know I don't want to be too specific um, but definitely my appointment is, is a great way that we've started that process I guess. Um, Syra Khan was writing in the mirror earlier this month about um, white working class men and Muslim women being the two groups that are, are really left behind in terms of um, economic um, flourishing and job opportunities and you know talking about some of the sort of cultural reasons for that is it part of the MC brief to get involved in exploring the reasons why um, uh, Muslim women either aren't able to access employment or choose not to yeah, so we've already provided submissions for that. Um, I think it's the Women's Select Committee report that did um, an extensive bit of research. You no know, Citizens UK have done lots of... So I think the, the research is already there. We've already provided submissions for that. And I think it's more about now how we can push for some change on these issues um, and encourage be better practice amongst um, employers themselves and maybe decision makers and, and the rest. Does the appointment of William Shawcross as the person to review the prevent strategy, does that pose some problems for MCB as a person, as a, as a group in feeding into that review? How are you going to manage that one? Well, we've had a lot of feedback on that. And I think the communities are really disappointed uh, giving you know, Mr Shawcross's background and some of the statements that he has said around Islam. Um, I think 
from the start, it's really put a lot of people, um, you, people are feeling quite disheartened. Um, so I think for us, really, it's um, internally, as I said, it's day three for me, um, but we are going to be having a conversation around that and thinking about, you know, our approach. Um, but yeah, our initial reaction and the feedback we're getting is people are pretty disappointed and it's not really been the, the answer that they've been looking for in terms of this. Do you interpret that appointment as a, a, a provocative move or uh, or not, or just an unfortunate appointment? I think at this point, it's an unfortunate appointment, definitely. I mean, you know, what else can we say? Um, you know, one of the projects that the MCB has been working on for about two years now, it's called the National Listening Exercise. So that has been on the back of the feedback we've received on Prevent, and that's been a, a kind of a, a project where we've been going around to communities and asking them about how they feel. And because we think the strategy needs to be, you know, focus on those that's been affecting disproportionately and that community should feed into that. So that's something we are actively doing. But yeah, with this appointment, it is definitely unfortunate. Are you going to, will you be cooperating with that review, though? Um, I don't think I'm in place to say right now. Can I um, have a chat with the others and see? <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to be nice to me today. Oh, um, I am. <laughs> but it's a question lots of people are going to be asking, aren't they? They're really, yeah. <laughs> they're really going to be asking about the MCB and it's, you know, how it engages Absolutely. with the prevent strategy or not. Anyway, yeah. I, I shall, um, having been nasty, I shall step aside now and leave somebody else to come and ask another question. I appreciate it. Look, I know it's coming up and definitely it's on my... Can we, can we have a chat about this um, for now? So, yeah, I mean, look, it's all it all kind of happened during the election. So I, I would rather have an informed thing to say on that than just make it up. Thank you. Thanks. We'll, we'll return to it, Zara. We'll invite you back when we return to it because it's uh, a live. Yeah, right on it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder if I could just ask another colleague of mine, Christopher Lamb, to step in with some questions now, please. Yeah. Hi, Zara. Um, congratulations on your appointment. Um, I wanted to start by asking, one thing I'm interested in is, is a different experience of Muslims in Scotland as compared to England and Wales. What, what would you say are the main differences there? Has there been more integration, do you think, of Muslims in Scotland than in some parts of the UK, England? Yeah, we get this question a lot. I mean, obviously, um, I think there are some things that are different and some things that are similar. So on the things that are similar is this, uh, I think the, the racism, Islamophobia, discrimination, we have this kind of saying of Scottish exceptionalism, things are different here, but unfortunately, um, you know, we're still having, maybe our population size is a bit different, but we still do have the same issues of institutional racism, barriers to employment, you know, I believe, unfortunately, the Scottish civil service is one of the, most, the least diverse in the UK. Um, so those are still there, but I guess on the positives, I would definitely say that community integration, I could be biased, um, is definitely uh, been much better here. And it could just be a way, I guess, the local setup is a bit different. But I mean, there definitely is that feeling of, you know, um, everybody's known each other and everybody is familiar and kind of the, a real shared partnership. But I'm sure, obviously, I feel very, very biased for saying that. Um, but I'm sure our English counterparts and Welsh counterparts um, have also their own, their own way of doing it. So I think it's totally biased in terms of what I think. I think Glasgow is one of the best places to be in the world. Um, and I love Scottish people and, and the culture and the nature of everybody. So, yeah, I don't know if I've officially answered that right. <laughs> That's fine. And, and what, what are your plans to work with other religions, other faith leaders? Um, I mean, there's obviously a, a, a need in the face of, of radicalization in, in, in the Christian tradition and obviously in the Islamic context what, what's your what's your plans on that yeah i know I, mean, I think the mcb has some really great interfaith partnerships already and i'm a really keen protagonist of interfaith work as well so i think again you know continue the conversation building the partnerships doing some shared work and projects and um, there's there's so much going on now actually i think in the interfaith arena and um, it's really quite outstanding um but yeah i believe my colleague Hassan has um a meeting with the Archbishop at, at the end of this week anyway on, on dialogue and so yeah I think the great thing about this time as well is that faith is definitely um, something that's keeping us going um, and working together and last Ramadan we had a wonderful interfaith um, iftar online and we had um, you know people sharing reflections from the different faith communities and how they were showing resolve through the pandemic 
and, and I believe that you know these things that when we do in partnership really do strengthen us as communities. Uh, and just what, one final question. Um, I wanted to get your response to uh, the Home Office report at the end of last year saying um, on grooming gangs, saying there was no credible evidence to say that it was one ethnic group being overrepresented in cases of child exploit, sexual exploitation. Uh, obviously, that was there was obviously a lot of reporting about how this was a Muslim problem. I wondered your your response to to that and how you're going to try and engage uh, to 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 combat these kind of tropes that have been put out against Muslims. Well, definitely. I mean, I think what's been really great about my appointment and election is that it's really challenged a lot of stereotypes and profiling and tropes and you know. A lot of the questions around, you know, what uh, a Muslim woman, even in, in leadership, can she do it? Is she allowed? You know, or are they going to let her be in charge? You know, I've had all these different questions, and I think it's it's the same principle for this issue as well. You know, in some ways, it's less about the data and more about actually challenging the misinformation, and I think that comes through our outreach work. And, and our ability to engage people in conversation. One of the things that we had was the Visit My Mosque um, project, although it's had to be virtual now and it's a bit of a shame we can't do that with these conditions. But I think maybe in this new context, finding other ways um, to, to build conversations. I always say to people, I said, we, shouldn't, we should be careful that our events are not just targeted at people that already like us. <laughs> Let's try and invite people that don't, you know, or, or maybe have questions. And I found that Visit My Mosque Project, because I used to actually do some of the, the tours, you know, people would ask you so many amazing questions. Oh, I've seen this mosque for 30 years and I never thought to come inside. I didn't really know if I'd be welcome or what it would be like, and I'm so glad I did. And so I just feel like it's it's this principle of, well, we want to get to a place where we can have a conversation. And um, because sometimes you could give people all the stats in the world, it wouldn't change their opinion or all the reports. It's actually about a meaningful relationship and humanizing, you know, that the, the person you're talking to rather than all the things that you believe them to be. Can I just ask, when it comes to Islamophobia, do you see this as culture a cultural islamophobia in the uk or where do you see islamophobia or do you see it within elites or uh, the establishment How, where do you see the roots of, of islamophobia yeah i mean i think it's it's kind of obviously it's manifested at a global level now and i think it, it cuts across all different parts of society you know you you do have that kind of institutional systemic side of it which comes into accessing opportunities and in the public life and then you do have your everyday you know maybe a bit of verbal abuse it could be physical abuse you know so I think it's coming from different places for different reasons and actually we shouldn't oversimplify the issue because it is a little bit more sinister and in, in, in how it permeates and it's a, it's a long-standing problem for some people it's about their understanding of a Muslim being a threat for others, it's the the unknown, not really sure, uncomfortable. It, it's you know the media propagation of it. It's for decision makers. It could be you know um, the structures and the way they're designed and they create inequality and not just for Muslims but for ethnic minorities or, or you know people of difference. You know, and I think all of us have to appreciate that actually, in some ways, Islamophobia is not just a Muslim issue, but one that is another. Um, divisiveness in society something very divisive that we've all got to kind of tackle together to, to actually overcome the roots which which come from different places great thank you christopher um, um we have dr azim ahmed from cardiff who um you have to unmute yourself azim yeah there you go hi there yeah uh zara congratulations first i think uh, i did tweet you but we didn't yeah have thank you so much um, and I think, uh, yeah, just to sort of uh, come in very briefly on the perspective from Wales, I think um, in general terms, on one hand, I think just to comment on the general sort of, I think, excitement um, about sort of Zara's leadership, uh, especially because she's Scottish. <laughs> so I think on one hand, it does allow uh, for some of the organisations in Wales to feel like this is someone who will understand some of the pressures of being uh, outside of London in a way, outside of England, um, you know, part of a smaller nation uh, with a devolved government. Um, and I think there's some excitement about that. Um, but just to kind of come in on the question, uh, Christopher asked about, you know, the uh, integration of Muslims in places like Wales or Scotland versus England. Um, much like Zara, I think I'm also on the kind of side that 
you know, maybe if you asked me this question 10 years ago, I'd be like, yeah, you know, Muslims are slightly more integrated and there's more acceptance and tolerance because, you know, Wales has a minority language, it has a tradition of uh, non-denominational independent churches, and that works quite well with the way in which Muslims also uh, come in with their own uh, language um, and also very independent mosques. But I think, uh, you know, the last 10 years, if anything, have taught me that many of the challenges in England and other parts of the world, in fact, are here in Wales as well. So while there are pockets of, you know, really strong friendships and uh, examples of great community initiatives and cooperation, there's also uh, places and areas where, you know, there's organized far right movements and uh, as well as, you know, um, <clears throat> sort of the more kind of common racism you might experience. Um, and so I think it's kind of accepting and recognizing that, you know, uh, the challenges here in Wales or any other region of the UK are not different really from anywhere else. And there's this habit and almost tendency to think of racism or Islamophobia has always been somewhere else. Um, and I think that's worth challenging. And just to say, finally, to speak well of our brothers in England, uh, I think one of the things that sort of uh, regions like Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland lack sometimes is the organization of civil society of Muslim groups and minority groups. And that's a really important counterweight to policies, to uh, racist uh, activities, to organized far right movements. Um, and being small in population uh, as minority groups often means you don't have the same civil society development, which sometimes makes us weaker, I think. And I think that's certainly true for Wales. Um, uh, and maybe it's true for other parts of the UK as well. But uh, yeah, thank you for bringing me in, Ruth. And thank you again, Zara. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing you speak for the rest of the session. You. Thanks, Hazim. Um, I wonder if we could go to Caroline Don now, who's put a question in the chat box, but would you like to um, just say that out loud, Caroline? Um, congratulations, Zara. Um, a fantastic appointment. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a freelance journalist, but I've got my Woman's Hour hat on at the moment because I work for uh, BBC Woman's Hour. I think we do have a conversation this afternoon, aren't we, Zara? Um, but um, I've, I've been looking at the work of the, the, the doctor and journalist, um, Quanta Ahmed, um, as she writes for The Spectator in the Huff Post. Um, and she, she expresses a view that there is no view for moderate Islam um, within the NCB, and that if any genuine questioning um, about practices or the faith <clears throat> coming from people like herself, or particularly young people, um, th that, that that conversation is not only shut down, it's not welcome, and she herself has been accused of Islamophobia. So it's a sort of an internalized Islamophobia, if you like. Um, I, I'm sorry, I would just really want to pick up that question about moderate Islam. Is there a place for moderate Islam? I'm not even sure what that is or how you would describe it, but that view about is there a place um, or do you want the MCB to be a place for questioning the culture and questioning the faith? Okay, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, so I guess my understanding of the question, I mean, and there's probably a lot that you've kind of asked, um, but what I would say is that, look, you know, um, as a young person, I think questions are really important, as is, you know, uh, challenging our assumptions and also challenging our views. Um, in itself, the MCB is not a theological body, so I'm just wondering where... Um, the, the kind of line of questioning is coming is it this about kind of theological questions or faith because that's not really what we do but definitely I think in terms of having more challenging conversations about why we do what we do and what we do is important in terms of you know a leadership point of view and bringing in voices that voices that you may not agree with is always good uh, because then it shows you how good your ideas and arguments are but I think in terms of theology and those kinds of questions I think there are forums for that and um, which is maybe a little bit different from what we actually do as a representative body. So I don't know if that, does that kind of cover what you're asking? It does, although I think that's interesting that you say that there isn't, that it isn't a theological body. I mean, there must be theology that informs your practices and the way that you view the world. So, um, and as you say, it was scholars um, and Muslim leaders who appointed you. So, Theology is presumably very important, isn't it? But not in a sense of preaching. I mean, we we actually are a broad representative body. So we, uh, you know, we're, we're Sunni and Shia. We're, there's lots of diversity even within that. So it's not like we're 
kind of, you know, I can understand, I mean, as a person of faith, there is, you know, principles and morals and things that we all have as faith organizations. But um, I just think that, you know, for me, it's um, perhaps maybe this is just a longer, deeper conversation. Um, and, you know, day three in, maybe I need to be more versed on it. But from my point of view, um, I, I think that there are places for those more deep intellectual and kind of philosophical questions on religions and but from my point of view as as a leader you know I want to make a difference and to make sure that we are making a difference for as many as we can so um that will be my aim and ambition and I think uh, challenging questions to what we're doing and why we're doing are really important and um, but in terms of faith itself and questioning people's faith and their ideas I think faith is quite a a personal thing to each individual, especially since we represent such a diverse group of people who may express their faith in very different ways. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, can I move on to Laura now? Laura Marks. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for doing this, Zara. It's so lovely to meet you and for doing it so early on in your tenure. I'm sure it's like being thrown to the lion's den. So <laughs> really lovely to meet you. Um, I, with Julie Siddiqui, who's on, on the call and who I know you know, we set up a Jewish Muslim. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm aware of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very interested in that relationship between the Jews and the Muslims here in Britain. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's traditionally been strained and the relationship with the MCB in particular is strained sort of institutionally. And, uh, and I'm aware of well-documented um, anti-Semitism within the Muslim communities, both anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, you know, they've been sort of tracked separately. And I wonder where, where this is in your plans and uh, what thoughts you have on um, addressing that issue uh, as you move forwards. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you, Laura. I'm not sure if I met both of you and Julietta at a women's conference. I feel like um, we've met before, but um, no, thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do do in, in building, I guess, bridges and keeping the conversation and dialogue alive um, for women as well, which is really important. Um, you know, I think from my point of view is that, you know, intolerance and any kind of discrimination and these kinds of things are really divisive and they perpetuate hatred and misunderstanding. Um, and these are just not, not how we need to work as a society. So from the starting point, you know, yes, we need to challenge all forms of these kinds of discrimination and hatred, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, so on and so forth. And there's plenty of them today. Um, so yeah, so absolutely, I think that we've got to we've got to continue to challenge that and um, wherever it permeates, from whoever it permeates, you know. So yeah, I think that's a clear one for me. I just wonder whether there's anything more specific you might be doing on anti-Semitism. Okay, I mean, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty early, as I said, it's day three, so uh, you're going to have to give me some time. But this is a great sounding board for me. Um, I don't have a team yet. I have not put together any document, project proposal, but I can understand. Like, I, I get where your passion is coming from and you've been working, you've been doing this for years. I get where all of your questions are coming from and I'm not going to commit to anything that I haven't even formulated. I was expecting you to. Yeah. Just, uh, just each form of racism is different and uh, I, I would love to work with you on all of them but but yeah no I appreciate that so for me this is great you know even if it's difficult it's great because at least I'm meeting people with 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 ideas challenging questions and I can take that on board and take it forward and remunerate um, when time allows me in my schedule so thank you so much for that Lauren thank you Julie as well for the great work that you do Thanks, Zara. Um, can we go on to Andrew Copson now? Hello, Zara. Hi. Uh, congratulations, as everyone has said. Um, I'm Andrew Copson. I'm the Chief Executive of Humanist UK. And I also took up my job at the age of 29, um, although some years ago. Um, <laughs> and so, and I enjoyed it. So um, I hope you have as, as great a time as, as I did uh, doing that. Um, it is not a disadvantage to be young. Uh, that is certainly <laughs> there's energy for now right energy for now yeah but you get you feel old very quickly um i have two two questions really um so um we uh, humanist uk we haven't had any formal cooperation or engagement with mcb for quite some time i think 2009 actually i was just looking up in my inbox um so uh, over 12 years um 
And so I just wondered if you had any aspirations for MCB to um, re-engage specifically in dialogue and cooperation with humanist organisations. Self-defining humanists are, are a minority in the UK, about the same size as self-defining Muslims, although there might be more people with humanist beliefs. And so that was my first question. Um, and then my second question was um, a bit like Laura's question, actually, about Jews and Muslims. Of course, we're aware from social attitude surveys and a very recent good survey on prejudice by the Wolf Institute, um, that there is anti-Muslim prejudice um, amongst non-religious people, though not so much as amongst other groups, um, and anti-non-religious people prejudice amongst Muslims. And we have programs to help people who even face that from their own families if they change their minds. So there's a question there about awareness raising and dialogue on prejudice. That's my second question. And then my third question is, in the same way that um, Jewish, or even Sikh has become for some people a cultural identity or even a political identity that they they sort of cleave to in identity terms, but not in terms of spiritual beliefs or religious practices. Do you think that that's something that's going to grow in the UK? And does MCB see a role for itself in sort of, could there one day be like a um, humanistic Muslims, people of Muslim heritage type member body, the MCB, for example, as there is in some other parts of the world, secular Jewish organizations that are members of um, uh, national Jewish coalitions? Or do you think that that's not something that's going to happen? Thanks. That's three it's questions. Sorry. Like three seminar worthy. I, I know, three really um, difficult. That I'm supposed to do in like a minute and do, I mean, I'll do my best. Maybe next time. <laughs> Maybe next time. So, yeah, I mean, I think. Number three is probably like a huge question that we need a session on, right? Um, so, <laughs> but I mean, in terms of one and two, so look, obviously, um, in terms of uh, that 2009, so obviously I wasn't aware of that. I mean, look, we're, uh, it's a new leadership. It's a new time for conversation. So I definitely welcome you to outreach and we can have a separate conversation and some of the key things you've raised. Um, and I think your second question was on challenging uh, discrimination, was it? Um, okay. So um, was it specifically in relation to Jewish groups, did you mean, or was it just... No, no, it's similar, similar to Jews and Muslims, oh. as in there's anti-Semitism amongst some Muslims and Islamophobia amongst some Jews, as Laura said in her comment in the message. Yeah. There's also um, prejudice surveys tell us a similar um, misconceptions and prejudices um, from some Muslims towards non-religious people, people who don't have a religion, and also vice versa. And I just wondered if you, if that was on your radar. You've spoken a lot about the engagement of MCB with religious groups and other faith oh, groups. Okay, I right. wanted to know if you had yeah, yeah. the same sort of agenda yeah. in relation to humanist organisations. Yeah, I mean, so it's, I'm really glad to have obviously spoken you spoken to you today because I, I mean that's um, that's a great thing that you've picked up actually. For me, I see it as beyond faith. Absolutely, I think you know we there are so many different parts of society, not even just exclusive to a belief, right? There is the, like, you know, because I mean, one area that I think disability is one that we've not really looked at enough, you know, there's so many things emerging as to people's challenges, access needs and different backgrounds, you know, refugees is another huge one, you know, the refugee population and um, how they've been represented in our community. So, so I think there's, there's lots of different areas beyond faith and belief itself, but definitely we're open to building partnerships and friendships and conversations with those different parts as manageable with our capacity caveated right so don't come after me <laughs> if i don't meet your uh, expectations um i'm just about surviving right now and um, but yeah if there's any tips on management of diaries or calendars or just as you all are really busy people please do send them my way i'm um, happy to attend any training workshops too so yeah from my side yeah beyond faith absolutely I, I think these are all important we're part of society right not just the faith community Thank you. Hope that answers everything, um, Andrew. Now, can I bring in Julie Siddiqui now, please? Yeah, Zara. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Julie. Yeah. yeah. So I don't have a question. I just wanted to um, say a massive well done for even standing. I think it took a lot of courage and uh, guts to do that. And I'm, you know, so many people have messaged me saying how happy they are, particularly Muslim women, of course, that, you know, definitely smashed a ceiling and definitely, you know, there's that whole saying of you, you can't be what you can't see. And so it would have been a great step forward in so many ways. So I think, for, you know, from that point of view, it's brilliant. And I just want to really note here, li listening to um, particularly the question that uh, Caroline asked about, you know, the MCB and the kind of breadth and, of course, you know, 
for me, the language that you're using around partnership and courage and friendship and all of those words that often we just don't hear, I think, you know, you're going to be the first to say that the MCB, of course, doesn't represent everyone. The 500 affiliates, of course, don't represent all Muslims everywhere in the UK um, and neither does it, I guess, claim to. But I definitely think, you know, all the signs are there for you mentioning words like friendship and partnership, you know, for me, uh, absolutely give all the right signals it's not fake it's absolutely coming from the heart you've worked really hard for all of your from 16 to 29 we've had conversations before about the, you know the challenges we know they're there so I think you know all power to you and you know you have a friend in me and so many of us really who absolutely want to help you succeed in this and you need to look after yourself <laughs> that you've already realized after day three and so, uh <laughs> I, I think you need to just make sure that you set your own boundaries. Everyone's going to want a piece of you and you need to just make sure that, you know, you, you set those and have the right kind of protection around you as well. But honestly, brilliant. Uh, and uh, here's to the next however many years it is, because it's going to be exciting. But thanks, Zara. Well done. So, Julie, you made me emotional. <laughs> That's such a nice thing, honestly. And thank you for your support throughout. Uh, it was really nice to see your messages. I don't even know if I've responded to everybody's messages, but um, it's so nice and I'm really grateful for that and for your, your encouragement and words. I think for women as well, I see there's a huge responsibility on me to keep paving that way and then to, to make room for more women and to make room for young leaders and say, you know what, you know, you're welcome here, so, so go for it. So I think that's been an important message for me, but I really appreciate your words, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, so we've got three more questions before we end, if you're up for it, Zara, just three more. Um, the, the first person I'd like to go to is uh, Kashif from um, Café Shabir. Can I bring you in next, please? Thanks, Ruth. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, Zara. Uh, it's Kash Shabir, um, CEO of Muslim Aid. Uh, I think that we both got appointed pretty much on the same day. Oh, did we, Malika? Look, uh, uh, not really a question as well. I just wanted to echo some of what, what Judy said. Is that um, I was one of the voting uh, just for that team. I was one of the voting uh, panel, I guess, on on uh, that vote uh, Zara in or, or or cast a vote. And I just wanted to say, look, you know, um, most of those people that were on that panel were were male, Muslim, and. Uh, and we're very proud, mashallah, tabarakallah, to, to have her represent us and, um, or at least the, the, the bodies that are the members of that community. And, um, you know, as a younger sister, you know, you know, I just hope, you know, you, you know that we have all got your, your back, alhamdulillah. And if you ever need any advice, support, whatever you need, inshallah, we're here for you, you know. Um, and for the rest of the people on the call, I think, the, you know, just to appreciate that, the general secretary role at the MCB is a volunteer role. These are unpaid people um, uh, that uh, pretty much give up their life um, outside of how well they're trying to earn an income and, 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 and do their work um, to represent um, some of the Muslim community. And here's some of the Muslim community. I think we all need to keep that in mind. Yeah, um, you know, they're doing their best to, to, to serve uh, the representative body. And, and um, you know, I, as a full-time CEO, of, of one of the largest Muslim charities in the country, just as a paid employee, you know, um, can tell you how horrendously difficult um, uh, uh, and, and uh, a job it can be. And for someone to take this on part-time or, 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 or even becomes full-time unpaid volunteer, you know, um, I have to commend her not only for, you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, for, for being the first uh, uh, female leader, at MCB, but also to be able to do this um, on top of everything else that she has got on board. So look, congratulations, uh, Zara, uh, really proud of you. Um, if you need anything, you know, you've got brothers and sisters here that, that are more than happy to, to, to give you the time and support and advice that you need, if you need it. And um, yeah, just, just wanted to let you know that we're here for you, inshallah. Um, thank, thank you, Kashif. I hadn't appreciated that. This is a voluntary role, Zara. Yeah. So what, what job will you be doing when you're not doing this? <laughs> well, I'm currently self-employed as a consultant, so I'm going to have to really figure out how to manage that. As I said, <laughs> I didn't think this appointment was going to be as uh, excited. I mean, I didn't think it, 
I mean, I've had to just take some time off work at this point in time to manage, you know, and, and there's been an incredible ask on me, even just within this forum. And I'm beginning to think, wow, I've got a lot to do. So yeah, that, that's, so yeah, there's a lot. I'm going to have to manage that as well. And all of the previous Secretary Generals, they, we've all, you know, worked full time alongside doing this. So it's our second job. Right. Um, but right. yeah, that is part of the sacrifice we make. Oh, I'm glad that came out. That's uh, interesting. Um, can I go to Dr. Michael Munnick from um, Cardiff University for your question, please? Thanks and uh, congratulations, Zara. Uh, I did my PhD in Edinburgh, one of the early studies on Scottish Muslim populations. So lovely to see you wow. at the top table. Thank you. Um, it's terrible to ask you a question about the end of your term at the beginning of your term. But just as a way of thinking, imagining what do you want the MCB to look like and what do you want Britain to look like when you're finished your term as Secretary General? Oh, typical uh, thinky question, right? I mean, I have thought about it actually because my own personal aim or view in life is that, you know, it's important to think about the end, you know, when you start, because when you start, you lose the focus of what the end is, right? Because you get curveballs come and I've got a manifesto, I've got a plan, but we've all seen it in history and with our politicians, <laughs> you, you pledge certain things and then by the end of it, you're not really sure how many you did. So for me, I think in a, in a very simple way of looking at it is I definitely want to see the perception of Muslims in Britain to change even just a little bit. And I think that opening up of who we really are and the messages that we're here to contribute to society as a part of society, right? So I think dispelling some of these misconceptions, I think making a lot of a bit of pushback on issues like Islamophobia and socioeconomic, whatever, whatever. So I think some of these big social issues to make a little bit of a, a move, but most fundamentally, I think, I would really like to leave the organization with a, a diverse leadership team that continues to represent the Muslim community in a really positive way. I think some ways there's a lot you can want to change around you, but perhaps it's actually within you that is the most important change. So I think if I leave the MCB in a much better place than I got it with a team that can continue the work, then I'd be really satisfied because I think everything is all of us, you know, we're, we're given a certain amount of time in these positions. We can only add a little brick to the house. So um, I, I'm, I've got, I manage my expectations of how much I can do as an individual or even with the team. But I think really it's it's always handing over the legacy to the, those that come after us. It's the most important quality. Um, and all of us have benefited from the people before us, right? So so I think if I could just make a little, make sure that actually that the house is still in good shape and the team is there to serve, um, then I'd be really ha happy with that. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. And um, Leo, if that's how you pronounce your, your name, Leo Nato. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> You can say Leo, that's fine. You can say Leo too. I'm from Brazil, but I'm the Methodist Interface Officer here in the UK. And, and Zara, congratulations once again. And I have a question, uh, two questions really, one at the more local level, ground, um, gra grassroots level, and on a more international level. So at the grassroots level, I'll tell you, we, we run a we run a program, pilot, pilot program for twinning mosque churches, and Julia was part of that. And I wonder if you could uh, reflect a bit what uh, your the, your <coughs> your election might mean for these efforts that are grass, at grassroots level. What MCB under your leadership might be able to do to <coughs> to encourage that? If that's uh, something that you think about and an emphasis that you might take. And the second question then is about <coughs> the cooperations. The cooperation we see at the level of the World Council of Churches, WCC, with the Muslim leaders, for the Pope, Pope Francis calling for humanitarian approach, and I, I wonder what do you see? What are the issues at the humanitarian justice and peace area that you might think? What are the main issues that should be tackled? Thank you, Zara. I feel like a world leader now. Um. <laughs> Okay, um, no, thank you so much, Leo, and uh, love. thank you for the congratulations and for the work that you're doing um, and for your smile. <laughs> it's definitely one that bright, brightens up the room. So um, I'm sure you're really good at the work that you do. So, I mean, from my point of view, you know, the, the interfaith space and the twinning, uh, I know my colleague Hassan, actually, he's been involved in some of that work um, with you all. And I mean, look, it's a positive project, so we don't need to stop what, what works. And, you know, and if there's capacity to continue to do it, then absolutely. 
And in terms of it at, at an international level, so currently I've actually been leading a task force on um, Sri Lanka and um, forced cremations due to deceased victim, uh, deceased bodies. So they're cremating Muslims and Christians. And that's been actually a renewal of MCB on the international platform. And we've actually engaged with um, some of the, the big interfaith groups. Um, and so, and I think actually we've been looking at some of the international interfaith forums as well. And so that's something we're working on to get a statement now, even from the Vatican and, and other um, faith leaders, because it's an issue that affects us actually, even though it may be as far away as Sri Lanka, it does affect us, you know, um, from a faith point of view, you know, burial, respect for the dead. Um, so I think there is so much to do in that space. It's quite unexplored. Um, and we're now operating in, in such a global way um, you know, it's quite exciting, but as always, I must manage my own expectations first. Um, we've got a lot to do at home. I've, been, I've got a list today from all of you guys, so uh, I've got many people to please. <laughs> and of course, keep an eye on my well-being, as Julie rightly pointed out. Um, so maybe we can continue the work together. I think that's always the best strategy. Um, and I'll have maybe about five to ten chocolate bars on hand, uh, just in case I start slipping. <laughs> So yeah, look, I'm really excited. I think there's lots of ideas, but with quality over quantity and uh, meaningful engagement is really at the core of it. So thank you so much, Leo, for your, for your recommendation, I guess, um, and some really great feedback on um, opportunities, what, what we can do in the future. Thank you, thank you. So I'm going to wrap this up, uh, Zara, now. You've, you've done really well for a whole hour to take all those questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I wonder if I could just ask uh, uh, or leave with, with one uh, final question from me, which is about the relationship with the media and what you hope your relationship with the media will be um, uh, as in, in your new role. Because we know the Muslim Council of Britain has a centre for media monitoring, and we know that it highlights complaints um, and corrections. And we know that it's produced reports on Islamophobia in the media. Um, how would you like to see your relationship with the media develop in your term of office? I'd like to say I think we're having a lovely honeymoon period. <laughs> I hope it lasts longer. Um, in the past 40 hours of my life, I've never had so much media <laughs> attention. Um, very invasive questions at times sometimes. And other times it's actually been a real pleasure. Um, a lot of the journalists I've been speaking to are fellow women and they've been so delighted by my appointment. It's been a bit more of a conversation than an interview at times. So I think, I think like the, um, although the Centre for Media Monitoring is monitoring, they're actually also positively engaging the media through roundtables and conversations. And I think it's not just about scrutinising the reporting, but it's also building the relationship and how we can work better together. So I think it, there is more to it. For myself, I mean, look, I see it as it's conversation even if it's hard and even if I'm under <laughs> under it in the oven was it in the frying pan or whatever it is right um it's about communicating right and it's about sharing a message and continuing to to welcome that challenge there will always be a balance to be had I guess and how much we can um keep that relationship as positive as we can especially if we're coming under fire but what's important is that you know the media is there it's got a, it's got a purpose it's got a reason and it's also human beings, right? So they've got a job to do. Um, but I think, look, it's, it's important to have a good and strong relationship with the media, even if it's one of accountability, you know, um, because that is part of their role. And from our side, I think Centre for Media Monitoring is doing so much more than just scrutinising, but also providing platforms for the media to engage with the community. So, um, but yeah, as I said, look, we're having a great honeymoon period. Uh, we're getting to know each other very well. Um, my, <laughs> they certainly know a lot about me now. Um, and, you know, I did a knockout nine yesterday um, across between TV, interview, radio, back to back. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely open. Well, today, thank you. Thank today, today's got to be in my trophy shelf, right? <laughs> Am I going to yeah. get specific <laughs> for this one? <laughs> Uh, we've come to the end of the hour um, and thank you very much indeed Zara for putting yourself through this uh, an hour long of, of questioning from from everybody and I sincerely hope that you'll be back again and that we'll continue to work well with you over your term of office so uh, congratulations from everyone on the call and thank you again for joining us.